Fuck the free world. Say it, can I get it? Fuck the free world. Fuck the free world. Fuck the free world. Yay. He did it, you guys. He, he made the video game and won the respect. A bottom barrel bitch no more, he was finally awarded the time to make the types of games that he wanted to for fucking once. A game that would be a movie, only without the restrictions of a movie, like not being allowed to have 50 minute long scenes of two people talking about nothing. Snatcher would be the name, and me not having played it is its game. I will do that in like a proper standalone review at some point, but for now the only two things of importance would be A, it has a tiny Metal Gear character in it who gives you hints, and B, while he was making it, Konami still konami resulting in the two NES games that we discussed last time. One was terrible, the other one was also terrible, but in a fun way, though neither really honored the vision that Kojima had for the series, I would assume. So, despite them keeping their creepy capitalistic boardroom blowbangs under wraps, Hideo would soon catch and break wind as he went straight to write his work, turning Snake's Revenge into Kojima's Revenge. The first of many. This game has that damn factor, where you go in expecting a basic old ass game but end up with an actual story with actual characters and actual cutscenes and actual music. It opens up in a powerful fucking way too, highlighting all of the fancy tech that you'll be working with, the characters, and of course the name of our boy, Hideo Kojima. Also, uh, the, the game itself is okay too. Same formula as the first one, aka the snake mans and the guard mans and the patterns and the levels that look like they were constructed out of Lego from a top-down view, all to create a Metroidvania proto-resi building-based hallway funneler. Only now we have a mini-map, you can go prone and crawl too, which seems pretty vital in a stealth environment, I'd imagine, and the radio is a much bigger player now too. Right out of the gate, Snake crawls up out of the abyss like a solid lizard going full cinematic on him with music cues and everything. We even have actual characters. There's Colonel Campbell, the generic military man who gives you orders in a stoic manner. Holly, a cutie female operative who's been posted here for a while so she knows all of the various ins and outs about the base, not only serving as hints of how you need do, but also giving you some context to make shit feel more real. Like how she mentions that the entire base uses a single water source and is thusly connected by sewers and drainage pipes. That one can use to your advantage. There's also Castler, a military and combat advisor who gives you the scoop on bosses, bits of their past and stuff to highlight why they're crazy, which will often surface tips on how to beat them too. J j just, just don't ask him about will cuisine. Whatever that means. Campbell? Hello? Jacobson, a creepy little bald man who hates war because he's your nature man informing you about the local flora and fauna, but also giving you shit for being called snake, whilst indeed not being a snake. And finally, there is Miller. A badass who knows just about everything about anything because he's a badass. N not a very interesting guy, I'll be honest. I doubt he'll ever be important again. But yeah, there's them and there's also a fair few more people who you meet along the way, like ex-ice skater turned spy with a tragic past involving that grey fox guy who sat on the floor in one, and even this mysterious tipster who warns you about mines and stuff. He's clearly inside of the base too, but on whose side exactly? Yeah, calls you old friend as well. Very mysterious indeed. But generally, the radio just serves as one big old band-aid to fix the issues that plague the original. I.e. not leaving you to blindly punch walls to see if shit blow. Welcome everyone, let's play Where's the Snake? Is he A. Underneath the tank B. Underneath this thing Or C. Disguised as this guard Admit your answers now Okay, and the answer is... If you guessed right, then, um... I don't know. <laughs> like this video or whatever. Big Boss is back. Hiding out in Zanzibar land. Not Zanzibar, the actual country, but like a theme park building its name. Probably has like a Freddie Mercury museum or something. Anyway, the dude has like a tons of nukes and mercs and even some sentient garden gnomes or kids. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. And where this might look like a big bad evil militia from the outset, it's actually a rather sad gray area. 
as the NATO hated the war orphan gnomes and the mercs, as they were big liabilities and had to be gunned down. But then, Big Boss arose from the heavens like a mustache twirling Jesus and saved them, giving them a reason to live a new home. A militia, perhaps, but one wanting to create the new status quo. No longer would the world be run by limp dick corrupt politicians, but instead by men of honor and loyalty. Bonds between men, gnomes, and, and teleporting cyborg ninjas. But along comes Snake with explicit orders to bring the whole thing down. Though, doesn't he truly belong here also? After all, he's only being used as a puppet by the NATO and he knows it. And not only that, Grey Fox turns out to be there too, now actually uttering more than four whole lines talking about how he's free now, and how Snake will never understand the true intentions of the boss, brother. Yeah, kill Snake's icy love interest introduced 30 minutes ago anyway and takes off with the Doctor Man. Shit's corny and goofy, but goddamn was I into it. The music, the dramatic anime tendencies, and the big reveals and epic portrayals all boil down to a nicely well-paced plot about how Snake is always one step behind. You see, the bad guys is well organized and technologically advanced, whereas Snake is just a one-man guy being led along by potentially untrustworthy sources, giving way to cool-ass sequences like the one where you say, set out to find and save a researcher, only, surprise, it's your boy Ninja telling you where the guy actually is. And so you beat his ass and then you get there knocking on the walls to find the guy, only he ain't the actual guy either. He's another guy who you didn't expect to be here and he's all like, Yes, I am not the guy. They transported the real guy elsewhere. I am old, but they are keeping me here for one reason. The development of Metal Gear. It's here, Snake. The ultimate weapon. The one you stopped was only a prototype. They are set to mass produce it soon. Ah, oh, Snake, you must stop it. And so then you go to the other building where the real guy is. Only when you get there, he dies because of a heart attack. And it also turns out that the other guy was actually a fake guy and an evil guy. And, and so he, he chokes you from behind. And then you shoot him with remote-controlled missiles. Uh... Yeah, so so this game is, is really dumb. But interesting due to how you and Snake are continuously led along like that, getting betrayed and plot twisted on at every turn. And hey, the boy himself is now an actual person too. Dude's cheeky, kind of grumpy, yet always ready to flirt and crack wise in a stoic and bitter kind of way. Given the ellipses, I could definitely see him as being a very gruff man. Oh, and uh, he also likes asking questions a lot by reverberating what was last said to him, which... I know that that's a thing in Japanese. It's how you show interest, kind of like saying mm-hmm in reply, but it, it does read a bit strangely when in English, though I'm, I'm sure they'll sort that out later down the line. Anyway, what they did certainly sort out was the game overall, as <laughs> hot dang is it good. There's big additions and minor additions that make it feel so much more stealthier than it has any right to be. Like how right at the start you don't just waltz into the base like an asshole, you actually have to crawl through fences, avoid patrols and surveillance cameras, and sneak in through vents. And once you do find your way inside, you'll be scowling through minefields, swamps, sneaking across creaky floorboards and bedrooms, and waving your way through dark dank rooms with all manner of vision-altering goggles. The radar is a pretty huge element here, as it allows you to see dudes otherwise off-screen, so you can plan ahead now, pretty much. And the game can take that into account too by having much larger, more complicated set pieces and dude patterns that spread across multiple screens. Additionally, once you get God, shit'll get jammed, meaning that you'll be in the dark, this actually making that a much bigger threat too, and it's also a much more natural state to be in. Dudes don't just flood the screen willy-nilly until you leave. They'll actively look for you, reacting when you walk over clangy grating. What was that noise? And in turn, you can distract them by knocking on walls or hiding from them by crawling under shit. Though, <laughs> at the same time, you can still just walk up on a boy and beat their buddy without them noticing. But, I mean, you know, what can you do?
The base and the guards within it, though, feel like one big functioning machine, with all people communicating like clockwork, setting up traps, ambushes, and all manner of crazy set pieces. You get infrared goggles so you can navigate past the lasers. You need to find a female officer by looking at how she walks, trapping her in the bathroom. They make you look for a codec frequency in the manual, and you can bucket man. You fucking catch pigeons using rations. There's big deserts, big swamps, eerie military compounds, nice crew quarters, and even this epic sequence where you climb a giant tower using windy stairways as you get chased and assaulted by dozens of dudes. After getting ambushed by stealthy boys on the elevator, of course, and before you backtracking through the entire base to first heat and then freeze a key to be able to use it. It is such intuitive design. Set piece after set piece, every screen is a treat. One can be a puzzle, a sudden high D, or just one of the many really greatly designed dude patterns. Metal Gear 2 is no longer just a bunch of corridors with simple guards in it. It is a fucking adventure. All killer, no filler, I guess. Even the base itself is a lot smaller, making the funneling much clearer and the design overall a lot more focused. And hey, the story stringing it all along is, as I said, pretty darn engrossing too. I mean, even the minor bosses have wee little moments. The teleporting ninja, for instance, reveals himself to be one of Snake's old partners, you know, and 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 and, and, and then he explodes. And Running Man over here, world's fastest mercenary, shows off just that by doing a little test lap around the arena only to be really fucking exhausted upon return. Shit's funny, and it makes my heart palpitate with glee. Whatever glee is, it, it, it sounds like something that would make a noise like this. But yeah, Grey Fox a traitor because he loves big bosses, but he is also actually the tipster as he also loves snakes. And so, after honorably trying to kill Snake with a giant mech, and then honorably setting his head on fire, they honorably have an honorable fist fight in a minefield where he honorably runs the fuck away like an honorable punk bitch. It's all good though because he had honor, and still considers Snake his friend, and then he died. But oh no, it was me all along, says Big Boss, only to be lit on fire by snake using a fucking spray can and lighter. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And then we escape with the cutie girl who was stationed here in an epic escape sequence and basically just fuck all of those kids. Fuck Big Boss and the better world that he wished to build for those shunned by society. Just fuck it. Snake is a free man now. The nightmares have stopped. Also, uh, during the credits, they show off all the portraits of our main cast with names and shit as 16-bit games often did, only <laughs> they actually show the high D as a fucking character. Uh, anyway, this game never came out over here, but in Japan it certainly tore that brand spanking new MSX2 a new one. Combine this with the success of Snatcher and it's safe to say that Kojima began to get a lot of clubs, both inside and outside of Konami. So, he actually got the freedoms and the monies allowing him to make another, even more self-indulgent, banter-heavy visual novel called Police Knots. So self-indulgent even that the MSX2 could not handle its power, and was released on the PC-98 thusly. Another Japanese PC console computer hybrid that mostly specialized in being able to display loads of text and thus also high pixel density, resulting in the crispest gifts this side of your favorite Tumblr blog. No, but seriously, look at this. It, it, it's disgusting. I, uh, I made a video about it even. Gross! Blah. Police Knots did well, anyway. It sold well, reviewed well, and was also remade for the 3DO, PS1, and Sega Saturn with Animation Studio AIC, making it look proper anime. I'd uh, talk about the how and why here, but I actually covered the whole damn thing already, so watch that. It is good, Vito. Important for now, though, is this character called Meryl and her foxhound tattoo. A fake tattoo, at least, seeing as she is a woman, after all. And the fact that Kojima had pretty much outdone himself three times in a row and was quickly becoming one of the most well-respected video game dudes in Japan. As I said, Metal Gear 2 never made it over here, let alone America as the MSX2 just wasn't resonating with people as it did in Japan, and the same went for Police Knots and the PC-98's fate. A Western Saturn release was planned but ultimately scrapped due to fuck you, and while Snatcher was slowly developing its own cult following, it still sold like ass overall due to it being stuck on the Sega CD, a failed add-on for the Megasys that no one bought. So outside of Japan, no one really knew who Kojima was, except for the few Europeans who would have played Metal Gear's MSX version. 
However, the boy still had some aces up his ass. A sequel to Metal Gear 2, in fact that would be so big, so ambitious, that it would star an all-star voice cast of people who weren't really known much at all yet, full 3D cinematic cutscenes that would shit all over everything else anyone had done so far, and a story that would finally give Solid Sneak the game, the cast, and the villains that he would truly deserve. Metal Gear Solid! Behind D. Colonel, what's a Russian gunship doing here? As the post-credits conversation of Metal Gear 2 already alluded to, Snake ran off to live a quiet life in Alaska, mushing dogs and cultivating mullets like a good boy. Sadly for him though, Campbell drags him out of his cozy existence and forces him to infiltrate yet another base. Thing is, is that some guy took over a nuclear storage and research facility, along with the leftover foxhound people, i.e. Big Boss's old gang that Snake was also a part of in Metal Gear 1. And that dude is called Liquid Snake. And set people consists out of Decoy Octopus, a master of disguise, Vulcan Raven, an Inuit big man big guns, Sniper Wolf, the sexy sniper ski, Psycho Mantis, a meme, a gimmick, and a psychic, a whole bunch of generic goons with masks, and Revolver Ocelot, a cowboy shootman whose liquids direct right hand man. Also, a sadist who likes to torture a lot and seems to have some of his own plans going on as well. And so, Snake needs to swim on in like a solid fish, penetrating that base like a solid dick. And save some science men, then take out the ultimate weapon, Metal Gear, of course. Oh, and, and we also have our radio cast, now dubbed Codec Team once again too, with Campbell returning and... Miller? Really? Uh, out of all characters who could have returned, we only get stoic granddad and G.I. Joe over here? Well, okay. Fine, I guess. All of the new people, though, are fucking great. We got Mei Ling, the cheeky save lady who gives you loads of sage advice and is also the person behind all of the technology that you'll be using. Naomi, someone still in Foxhound, providing all manner of intel on the evil people as well as being a medical expert. Natasha Romanenko, a sultry sexy Russian lady who's a gun nut that's being able to inform you on all manner of items and weapons. And you also meet some people in base who will become part of Snake Circle too. Like this weedy little nerdy Otaku guy who built robots, including Metal Gear itself, called Otacon. Meryl, a cutie female operative who's been posted here for a while so she knows all of the various ins and outs about the base. And even this mysterious tipster who warns you about mines and stuff. He's clearly inside of the base too, but on whose side exactly? Yeah, calls you old friend as well. Very mysterious indeed. There once was a soldier called Johnny, who hated the cold and missed his mommy. The woman was built, and so him she killed, or at least left him in a state that was sorry. Now some time has passed, and a cold he now has. And while guarding Snake's cell, a case of diarrhea just as well. Oh, poor Johnny. Oh, poor pooping Johnny. The gameplay here is basically the same once again. Snake Man's Guard Man's Key Cards Lego. Only now you'll have a map with vision cones on it showing what dudes can and can't see, making your state as opposed to theirs a lot clearer. And how you engage with them has also changed a fair bit as well. Being that you can now choke them, punch them, throw them around a bit, and of course shoot them with gun. But with added elevation and dimensions and stuff. Shit ain't as easy as a wee bip or boop on the head, as the camera may or may not be a bit too narrow, making the game still kinda 2D as you'll be looking at the map for like 80% of the time. And Snake's life bar is also noticeably tiny. Getting spotted means death, pretty much always, especially early on. So it is a good thing then that your sneaking arsenal has tenfolded. For example, you can distract them by knocking on walls or hiding from them by crawling under shit. Use flash or chaff grenades to blind dudes or disable surveillance cameras and also just kind of easily walk around them due to the obvious nature of the vision cones. Really, the basic dude setups of yore are just kind of thrown by the wayside a little bit in favor of some excellently tight pacing by way of the one-off set piece.
you do not just waltz into the base like an asshole, you actually have to crawl through fences, avoid patrols and surveillance cameras, and sneak in through vents. And once you do find your way inside, you'll need to look for the guy, only he ain't the actual guy either. He's a fake guy and an evil guy who dies because of a heart attack, though he does also tell you how Metal Gear, it's here, Snake, the ultimate weapon. And so you bomb wall basement to find another guy who also dies because of a heart attack. And then there's this cool tense boss fight against Revolver Ocelot, only teleporting Ninja who cuts off his right hand. So now, with all your leads dead, the colonel advises you to contact Meryl by making you look for a codec frequency on the back of the box. And following her advice, we get infrared goggles so you can navigate past the lasers and fight a fucking tank with grenades and taking out an electric grid by shooting the power box with a remote-controlled missile, using a gas mask to pass the gas room, after which we find our main man, Otacon, who pees himself because of the teleporting ninja, for instance, reveals himself to be one of Snake's old partners, you know, i.e. Grey Fox. From floor boy to honorable boy to ninja boy. Wow. And that's just the first couple of hours. There's loads more afterwards, of course, like how you fight a hind D on a rooftops and then climb a giant tower using windy stairways as you get chased and assaulted by dozens of dudes. After getting ambushed by stealthy boys on the elevator, of course, and before you backtracking through the entire base to first heat and then freeze a key to be able to use it. And fucking find a Meryl by looking at how she walks, strapping her in the bathroom. What's that mark? Huh? Oh, this? It's a paint tattoo. It's not real. It is such a jam-packed fucking game with so many memorable, original, and clever moments following in rapid succession. Like I said, it's barely even a stealth game anymore. It's just a fucking set piece collection, but goddamn, what set pieces these are. Hmm, ketchup, eh? That's Johnny. If there is one thing that the Metal Gear series is known for, it's Snake's a its cutscenes, which started here. The game opens up with a full 30 minutes of banter, which isn't even counting the briefing scenes, and most importantly, all of it's well done. PS1, well done, perhaps, but there's over three hours of this shit in total, and it's never boring. Voice acting good, writing decent with splashes of profound almost, and camera work, lighting, and music that are so deliciously tense and eerie that it hurts. That takes care of the cremation. Cold is the motif that I would pull out of my ass here overall. The soundtrack has loads of airy chimes and soundscapes, the walls and tiles are all tinted blue, the snow crumbles under your feet leaving behind footsteps, and the jittery PS1-ness of it all could almost be mistaken for the shakes. The sounds of humming computers, buzzing generators, ringing fluorescent lighting, and the squeaking of mice as you crawl your way through a vent in pitch black darkness, not to mention the tired, drony, militaristic tone of the dialogue in general, make for big immersion. It's set up so that you need to input two different passwords in order to launch the device. There are two passwords? Yes. Baker knows one, and I know one. Baker? The president of arms tech. That's right. Each of us needs to input our password, or there can be no launch. But pretty much, the moment Snake enter, you get the sense that something ain't right. Sure, the colonel might have told you that nobody knows you're here, but Liquid certainly seems aware of where Snake be, and no one on your team seems willing to admit that. Yet, as stated, both people you were meant to save also die of heart attacks, not to mention that for a facility meant to be about nuclear disposal, there's certainly a lot of guns around for no reason. Could that be a gameplay contrivance, or is there more to it? Well, Metal Gear Solid marks the point in the series where shit starts to heavily reference, comment on, and intertwine with real-world events. D -d -d don't you dare ever bring up the oil leaks again, okay? It's retconned. Oh yeah, Kojima don't like nukes. Dude grew 
grew up in a Cold War, doing so in a country where the literal fallout of World War II could still be felt, and in this game, yes, you feel the same, as, you know, we're just kind of stuck with this shit. We've yet to find any good ways of disposing of it, and those being tasked to do so aren't exactly doing it with the greatest of care, considering that it disappeared from the public conscience. For example, in 1961, a B-52 aircraft carrying an MK-239 nuclear bomb from one storage facility to another was flying over North Carolina. But upon passing over the town of Goldsboro, oops, they fucking dropped it. Now, the thing came equipped with its own little parachute and managed to land without wiping half of the entire state off the map, but when classified info regarding this incident became public in 2013, it seemed pretty fucking apparent that the damn thing was only about a baby hair away from having detonated when they found it. And like, Shit like that happens, okay? Leaks are also common, even in cold storage. Reactors skimp out on checkups, which is how fucking Fukushima happened. Not to mention the stuff secretly being pawned off on black markets, which is how countries in the Middle East keep getting their hands on it. And basically, what I'm saying is, is that while it might not feel like it, we are always more or less on the verge of an accidental oopsie fallout situation. And while walking around Shadow Moses, it's hard not to feel that. Noxious gases flowing into rooms, rendering entire floors unusable, warheads just laying about the place, loads of dudes in hazmat suits walking around like they just don't give a shit, and generally, there's more cobwebs, rats, and dead air here than any active personnel trying to maintain shit, and so it was easily co-opted by anime terrorists, who are surprisingly fleshed out given the exploding me-men of games past. These motherfuckers actually stick around for most of the entire game, having multiple fights and appearances and can be seen scheming post-snake leaving the room in a self-aware fashion, furthering the vibes that you're totally being played on. But even with all that, it is still in their real-life intertwinedness where their true characters lie. Sniper Wolf, for example, is a Kurd, a group of people being genocided by Turkey for decades going on even today. And yet, no one speaks up about it. In Turkey itself, it's more or less illegal to do so, so fair enough for the people there, but even the UN and other global organizations seem to turn a blind eye. Turkey be trading, you see, and money and potential EU membership deals even still somehow are also on the table, keeping things hush. Anyway, she's from there and thus raised on a war zone with naught but a string of hope to hold on to. But then, Big Boss comes along, offering her shelter and a purpose. Suddenly, she no longer views war as a victim but as an insider partaking in it, viewing the world through the scope of her rifle, as it were. Really soaking in the minor details as well as the fragility of human life in general. So, naturally, she don't take to people much. Hopelessly stockholming all over her targets, sure, but generally she only hangs with her husky dogs, who will hate Snake when he sneak, but will love him once he carries her handkerchief. Really giving you the impression that she probably ain't too bad of a person, maybe kind of I don't know. She uh, also has a wee thing with Otacon beefing up his complex character too, thus leading us to this got meme of a line. Do you think love can bloom, even on a battlefield? But then she is also rather trigger happy and seems to be weirdly disconnected from the implications of her taking people out. Uh, maybe these drugs have something to do with it. But in any case, all bosses are quite like that. It would take ages for me to go in depth on all of them, so you're just gonna have to take my word when I say that you will give a shit. Making their eventual boss fights not only hype, but also bittersweet, given that you just spend most of the game connecting with them and all. Subtly through real world connections, but also through in-game meanings brought on by the hours upon hours of codec banter that you've been hearing about them. <laughs> Oh, right, yeah. So, so so the radio is disgustingly fleshed out now, boasting lines for literally any situation, item, and character for all characters. The writing and tone here, for one, is quite salacious. Hitchcock may have said that the bad movie is the movie of people talking, but he is old and dead now, so who cares? I love hearing Kojima characters talk, anyway. This started in police knots where every object on screen would be interactable in some way leading to decades worth of info, personal or otherwise, about it. But shit wasn't exactly fully voiced and here it is. Though the tone remains the same. Like a poorly written book with far too much exposition that still managed to be interesting due to how it makes you feel for the characters giving it. I can tell that he cut his teeth on visual novels, is what I'm saying. As literally everything gets explained in detail and is also given context. 
the radar and stealth camo for instance, while already fancy tech that's interesting to hear about on his own, is made even more engaging by it being made by your save girl Mei Ling. Which she is happy to tell us about as it made her join MIT because she wanted to help people in a practical sense. It's cute. An Otacon soon to be revealed as Snake's only friend is also the designer of Metal Gear. Dude watched anime growing up which would directly inspire him to do so. S see what I mean? I'm glossing over loads of deets regarding loads of things because time... But shit like this gives you a reason to give a shit, by not only actually factually explaining what it do, but also by giving a fun little anecdote and a friendly face to associate with it right away. Character building, I think is, is what we call that, and Kojima has it on lockdown for sure. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Mm -hmm. Snake laughter is the best medicine. You should be happy you've got enough free time to play a game. Whoa, 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 whoa hey. <laughs> Calm down there. What is even a fourth ball break when there is no fourth ball to be broken? MGS1 introduces one dangerously critical meme, aka the nano machines, son. These are like machines that are tiny, that you inject into your blood or whatever that can do all kinds of things, like explaining away abstract gameplay elements. For instance, the fact that you can't use your weapons in certain areas isn't just lazy design, it's because of the nano machines restricting your guns as a safety measure. And the fact that Snake ain't cold is due to the nano machines regulating his body temperature. Him tanking bullets like a motherfucker is because of the accelerated healing, and so on. They simultaneously make the gameplay feel less abstract whilst also making the story appear more self-aware and kind of postmodern. Like I said, this series never had a fourth wall. Right in the first game, Big Boss tells you to turn off the console and characters have always blatantly told you how to button. Not to mention shit like and fucking find a Meryl by making you look for a codec frequency on the back of the box. Nano machines are the player allegory, pretty much. The lack of a fourth wall isn't at all like, lol, this video game is fake, but instead more like, lol, this is a living, breathing world inside of your PlayStation and you will give a shit about it and help these people save it. And all of this accommodates into the now very famous sequence being the Psycho Mantis boss fight. It starts off with music. It, uh, it sounds a bit out of place given the rest of the OST so far, but then right when you'd start to think that, it suddenly stops. Well, that's strange. There's no guard. What happened to the music? I'll keep a lookout. Make sure you're ready, okay? Already, this makes things questionably diegetic, but right before you even have the time to consider that, some weird shit starts happening with Meryl. She starts getting headaches and begins calling you Mr. Foxhound, but... Even stranger is the fact that when you switch to first person view, you see through her eyes and not snakes. The thing is, is that her mind is being controlled by floating Voldo over here. <laughs> and dude's up on some weird shit. Reading memory cards, though I ain't got no saves. Fucking with your television, which doesn't really fly on modern screens anymore. Moving your controller by instructing you to put it down and having it wiggle through vibration. And lastly, you can only beat him by changing the controller ports. As, you see, that's all his mind jacking is. Nano machines, aka the player, aka the console, aka the game. He, he's jacking the game. Your window, which for those within it means their minds, as you're about as close to a brain as Snake will ever have. And yeah, it's such a weirdly layered gimmick, isn't it? It seems like a cute little meme at first, but the more you think about it, the more mind-jacked even you yourself will begin to feel. So everyone you meet dies, which is because Naomi a douche who injected you with a virus called Fox Dye that kills people of a certain persuasion. The effects that this will have on Snack are still unknown, but she did this because she's Grey Fox's little sister and she knows Snake fucked him up because he's a cyborg now. So you know, revenge and all that. Not why he's here though, dude just really loved getting his nips punched and wanted some more. 
Either way, Snake sneaks his way through the base, killing motherfuckers until he gets fucked in return, leading to gaming's first interactive torture scene. Not before Liquid, Ocelot, and Kojima vent their frustrations though, talking about how Liquid is Snake's brother as they clones of Big Boss who was actually like the perfect soldier basically. Ocelot also talks to you about saving and cheating, so... That's nice. Uh, but yeah, Snake and Liquid are sons of the boss, but because Liquid got the shittier end of the gene stick, he can't execute his evil plan that needed Big Boss's boss juice for some reason. Well, look, it, it fails anyway, so who cares? But due to Snake deodorant torching Big Boss to death, they needed Snake's snake juice instead, and so that's why he here. Miller was never Miller, you see. It was actually Liquid all along, which is kind of impossible given how you can call him at any time and also the hair reveal. Uh, how does that work? Did the snake see all of this in his head somehow? I, I thought it was just a radio. Weird. But, like I said, shit fails. Snake shoots missiles at Metal Gear and then Grey Fox comes along and sacrifices himself to stop it for good and then the two states have a fist fight too. After which, big escape sequence, where Liquid dies due to Fox die. Also, in the background, it turned out that Campbell wasn't even in charge of the situation, that he was just kind of held hostage due to Merrill, who is his niece, also being in the base, thus forcing him to comply with the actual bad guy, the Secretary of Defense, who wanted to lure both Snake and Liquid into one place so that he could essentially bomb the shit out of them. But, you know, that also fails, so who cares? Where, uh, where's Ocelot at, though? Yes, sir. The entire unit was wiped out. Those two are still alive. The Vector? Yes, sir. Fox die should become activated soon. Right on schedule. Yes, sir. I recovered all of Rex's dummy warhead data. No, sir. My cover is intact. Nobody knows who I really am. Yes, the DARPA chief knew my identity. But he's been disposed of. Yes, the inferior one was the winner after all. That's right. Until the very end, Liquid thought he was the inferior one. Yes, sir, I agree completely. It takes a well-bounced individual such as yourself to rule the world. No, sir. No one knows that you were the third one. Solidus, what should I do about the woman? Yes, sir. I'll keep her under surveillance. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. President. This game is great. A classic. There was nothing else like it at the time, and it introduced so much new shit. And as a result, it would become Konami's best-selling, best-reviewing, and best-liked, most critically acclaimed zeitgeist-banging video game in history. Launching Kojima into the pop culture stratosphere, which was good as the dude had already set up a cheeky sequel hook anyway. Perfect, right? Kojima happy? Konami happy? Hell, they even got to milk it a tiny bit by releasing a Wii spin-off VR missions game that would feature hundreds of cool Snake Man, Guard Man setups in this weird abstract, storyless place of, of meta-mystery, and budgets, hype, and expectations for whatever solid sequel would be were sky-fucking-high. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, behind the scenes, in Kojima's mind, frustrations were beginning to brew. Fuck the free world! Fuck the free world! Fuck the free world! 